Hello, and welcome to season two, episode six of Radical Embodiment, the podcast. I'm your host, Emily Wishall, and I'm an embodiment coach and a certified rolfer. And as always, I'm really excited about today's guest and bringing you Karen Mahar. Karen is a good friend of mine. I've known her for the last, I think, just like handful of years. She has her PhD, so she's actually Dr. Karen Mahar. Karen has her doctoral degree in comparative sociology. She's also the co-founder and the COO of Animal Flow, which is how I was first introduced to Karen, how I know Karen is I'm an Animal Flow teacher. So if you're unfamiliar with Animal Flow, briefly, it's a quadrupedal movement training system, meaning it's you move on the floor, you're crawling. It was developed by her business partner, Mike Fitch. And so Karen also has her bachelor's degree in film production. And so early on, about 12 years ago, kind of how Karen and Mike started to become business partners is as Mike was developing Animal Flow, Karen used her experience from her bachelor's degree to help make exercise videos of tutorials that Mike was creating. And then, you know, 12 years later, their little side project is now a global company in both of their full-time careers. And Karen is an avid skier. She's a hiker. Hear her talk about that in our conversation. And our conversation is really geared towards being a woman that has been in the fitness industry for 12 years. I was curious just to peek her brain and experience a little bit about what that's been like, especially, you know, here we are in Radical Embodiment. This intention and mission of this work is to really shift the narrative that a women's worth is built around our weight. And so I'm excited to get to share with you our conversation and interview, and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope it's enlightening and helps kind of shed light on some of the marketing that we see, some of the advertising that we see. And if you're having internal translations of what that means about you, just to know that you're not alone in that. So go ahead and listen to the episode now. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Karen Mahar. Um, Karen, I'm so excited. Thank you for being here. I I'm really feel to be here. good. I'm just delighted. I like you just, I feel like have such a actual personal experience having been in the fitness world for 12 years and being this, you know, radical embodiment, this podcast, my platform, it's really my overarching intention is to support women in shifting the narrative that our worth is tied into our weight. And so I'm just excited to connect with you deeper um, and hear some of your just own firsthand and being an owner of a fitness company. And yeah. Hey, thank you, Emily. Yeah. So I like to start these conversations just with the kind of a big question, um, but I like hearing everyone's individual take of what does embodiment mean to you? I think embodiment to me, I, I think of that as how you feel your place in the world and how you feel your comfort with yourself in your own body. And I think that, so you're talking about the external and the internal and how they intersect and mm. how that allows you to then embrace and live your life on a daily basis. I love that. So you see it as like the intersection, maybe the integration of how you live externally and how you feel internally. Yes, exactly. Cool. I think it takes both and that, and that both, they can both be very different things happening. You know, your external could be good and the internal might, but when, when they sync up and when you mm. find a way to make them merge, that's when you can thrive and be and mm. have a great life. I love that. Um, so with that, how have you seen in regards to, in your own journey in life, the more embodied you've become, the more that you've connected and learned to connect with your body, how would you say, like, what specifically has that shifted in regards to how you feel about your body and how you feel about yourself? Like, what do you experience differently? Sure. I think um, I could actually take this back to, I lived most of my adult life in Miami. So I was there about 30 years. And to most people, that would be paradise. <laughs> but to me, it was hot all the time and humid. I, I spent 30 years feeling like I was melting and I don't actually like lying on the beach. I get really bored. Mm -hmm. So I lived in this place that so many people thought was the ultimate to live. And I just was not really happy there. I was not feeling connected to nature because I didn't want to go outside and do all these activities. I wanted to go somewhere where it was air conditioned. 
So, and I didn't really understand why was I not loving living in paradise? It seems like something that should be natural. Mm -hmm. So as Mike and I, my business partner, Mike and I, as we were starting Animal Flow, we reached a point where we wanted to be able to expand it around the world. So we spent two years and we were able to move to a new country every year while we were trying to develop the thing there. And what they gave me the luxury of doing was I got to experience so many different cultures and places and living environments. And I got to really see what works for me and what doesn't. And I realized, one, number one, I don't like being hot. So even if I'm on the most beautiful beach in the world, I don't want to be there. What I liked was mountains and changing seasons. And um, we also got to live in a lot of different types of houses. And I got to see what type of actual built environment works for me. What do I like? And I learned I like space um, or light. I like um, views. So when it came time to come back to the U.S. when we were picking where we were going to live, we just made a list of criteria of what kind of places do we want to live. And Boulder popped up to the top. It met, checked all the boxes. So we moved to Boulder and immediately I'm just happier. Um, I live where I can walk outside of my house and I can hike every day. Yeah. And I love to ski. And these are the things that make me happy. So having brought these things around me really mm -hmm. made a, an immediate change in how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And then from um, internally, you know, during this time, I'm, I'm working in the fitness industry and I've been little, I've had, I've been bigger right now. I'm kind of a medium size. So I've experienced it from all these different perspectives of how my body is and, and relating to the fitness industry. And I was able to change um, from working out just to work out because I felt like I was supposed to, you know, I'm co-owner of a fitness company. I should be working out. I should be really healthy. And it always felt like a grind to me. I'm not someone who can just be like, oh, I'm going to go lift and I'm inspired and I feel great at the end of that. That's not how it is for me. Um, but coming here enabled me to shift it. So now my workouts were more geared around, I'm going to hike, I'm going to ski. And of course I do animal flow, which is our company and that's all ground-based movement. But again, the purpose of animal flow isn't to make you thin, it's to make you move better and to make you feel better in your body make you connect to your body and think about it. So now when I'm working out, it's because I like to feel the way I do and it's going to make me feel better when I ski. So it kind of brings it all feel so it's full circle now. So now my workouts are connected to where I live and it's all things that inspire, inspire me. Like I just love being out on the mountains. It's just so beautiful. And yeah. having a body that's able to climb the mountain Mm. is important to me. So I am so much more likely to want to work out and do that now. So for me, all of that now, I'm, I'm living a, a much more happy embodied life that connects with who I am and what makes me feel good. And that's, I thank you for sharing that. And um, it feels like what you just gave as your personal example really lines up with even just how you defined em embodiment for you personally is, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, and sorry, somebody's doing some sort of yard stuff. They just decided outside <laughs> my window. Um, so if you hear that noise, that's what's happening. But yeah, it sounds like what you were really intentional about is what were you desiring more in your everyday external environment that supports you and your happiness as well as in, you know, doing some internal work, but how bringing those two together, the internal and external, yeah. so they're more aligned how that supported you and even shifting, it sounds like how you operate in regards to exercise or movement and fitness and doing mm -hmm. it more from a place of not because you should, right? We all know we should work yeah. out, right? <laughs> um, but so many of us or people don't or struggle with being consistent. So there's so much more than just telling you just better do it. Um, and I love how, you know, for you, the motivating factor has one has been, yeah, you want to ski, you want to feel good on the mountains or even just being able to ski and hike in and of itself is exercise. And um, and the intentionality of animal flow, which is I briefly said in, the, in Karen's bio when I introduced you earlier, it's how I know you is, is <laughs> animal flow, um, which we'll, we'll, I think we'll dive in deeper a little bit because um, it sure. feels pertinent to this conversation. All right. um, okay. So since you just mentioned animal flow, and if anyone's mm -hmm. unfamiliar with animal flow listening to this, go check it out. You're going to have to say that and go try it. It's, it's honestly of any movement I have done, I know that it like, I don't have scientific evidence to say this, but I now have client evidence because <laughs> um, we're specifically working with emotional repatterning and rewiring. And I'm having mm -hmm. client after client have their own personal experience of when doing animal flow and after doing animal flow, cognitively and emotionally, their state of being is very different, meaning it's much easier for them to access a um, 
more empowered choices, more empowered thoughts. Mm -hmm. They're not so quick to go into story. They're able to just be with emotion and process emotion. Yeah. So I would like, do you have any personal takes or experience on, on that? Um, yeah, well, you know, when, we, when, we, when, as Mike was creating the animal flow program and, and we, there's, you know, 5,000 years of people using animal locomotion patterns and that mm -hmm. so by no means invented the idea of quadrupedal movement or moving around on your, your, your hands and knees. But what we did was created a, a system in a way that anyone could access it and be able to practice it and learn it. And as we were putting together a system, people ask us all the time, well, why don't you, you know, have a spiritual component to it? Why don't you meditate at the beginning of every class or at the end? And we felt it was very important to never do that because everyone brings their own perspective to it. So if for you, it's a religious experience or a spiritual, or you like it, everyone can put their own stamp on top of it and put their own meaning on it. So we keep it strictly as a physical practice. So I think that's really important because yeah. that is what allows everyone to experience it themselves. You're not being read someone else's mantra or this, what's supposed to be a spiritual take on it. Uh -huh. You take what you want. You create your own and put your own. I appreciate, out. I've never heard you guys say that like that. I'm like, oh, so yeah, you can't, so yeah. It's, you know, it's an open book. You make it what you want, but it, because it is such a, a different practice and it's skill-based. So it's not like when you're, you know, you're doing reps and you're just, you know, lifting things and you're thinking about the laundry or the calls you need to make afterward or your mind's just running. If you're doing animal flow, you have to be thinking about what am I going to do next? What is the correct form? How am I holding? So you're completely focused on you and your body and you're in tune with it. Yeah. And you can't think about anything else. Mm -hmm. So after a while of doing that, that in itself can become, you know, a very meditative thing to be doing. You're just thinking about you and your body and where you are in space and how you feel and what you're going to do next. And going through that for a while, it's like a meditation. So of course, when you're, when you're done with that practice, you're going to be ready and open and a little bit more for, for what's next. So I could see how you would talk about like your clients or mm -hmm. at the end of it, feeling like they've just been through a session or something. Well, they have, mm -hmm. um, and it's, and it's not often that we get to take time out and spend half an hour or an hour and think about nothing except how does my body feel and what am I doing with it in a way that's and then, exactly and I was going to say in a way that feels too is is fun is playful like yes it's yeah. challenging physically it's challenging cognitively and it's it's fun right so yeah. it's not just like oh I need to go sit rigid in my vipassana and not and try not to think <laughs> for an hour <laughs> like, um yeah, you know if you're a vipassana practitioner great but like for most of us a lot of us not most but it's it's for yeah it's a challenging practice mm -hmm. um but i think i just see that such value in and so to give just a little bit of conceptualness for anyone who doesn't know what animal flow is so you have a visual it is ground floor based movement mm -hmm. it is very specific ways of moving your body so it's not just like Woo, we're gonna roll. Um, That's okay. And um, there's a lot of nuances to each movement. Being, I feel like animal flow in itself is, is very different than a lot of different fitness programs. Um, and often I think when people are seeking out a fitness program, not always, but often weight loss is one of their goals. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just love, how do you guys approach that? Well, it's very interesting because, you know, we are, we are a fitness company and for many people, the reason they're doing fitness is because they want to lose weight. So we can't get around it and just say, oh, we don't do it. But we've always been very conscious of not making weight loss something that we use in our advertising or that we say is a reason to do animal flow. We say you do animal flow because you're going to learn to move better in your body. It's going to make you better at other things you want to do. It's going to make you more flexible and mobile and powerful and strong. You'll never hear us say animal flow is going to make you skinny. Um, but we get emails every day from people who are saying, I want to lose weight. Will animal flow help me lose weight? Is this what mm -hmm. I should do? And we'll say, well, you know, we try and steer the conversation around and say, you know, this is what it's going to do for you. And probably as a secondary effect, if you're doing all these things, you're probably going to lose weight while you're going to do it. Animal flow is a very intense program. Mm -hmm. And then they'll write back immediately. Well, how, how many hours a week do I need to do to lose weight? Like people want to get specific and bring it right back to, they don't want to hear about these overall health benefits. They want us to tell them. Um, when we were 
first starting Animal Flow like 10 years ago and Mike was going on a lot of the, the like the national talk shows and he'd spend 15 minutes taking them through the routine and explaining the benefits and he'd show them how to do stuff. And at the end they say, that's great. How many calories does this burn? And we'd be like, oh, we don't want to answer that question. Like, it's such a complex question. Like how many calories does it burn? Well, how long have you been doing it? What is your size? What is your metabolism? I mean, there, that's not an answer you can give a sound bite to, but every talk show we were on, or when I say we, I mean that Mike was on, mm -hmm. every talk show wanted that question. How many calories will it burn? Can I lose weight doing this? So we were like, oh, we finally just made up a number. Yeah. Um, we've recently had someone who's actually has done some studies that are peer reviewed and published that talk about the fact that animal flow does burn the amount of calories that makes it an acceptable weight loss exercise regimen approved by mm -hmm. ACSM. So we know that it does, but we still, we don't want you to do animal flow because you're trying to get skinny. Like that's not the, the reason you do it. You do it because it makes you better in your body. And then that makes you better at everything else you want to do. Like we say, yeah. you, you know, if you're a biker, we're going to make you better at that. Maybe you like to do CrossFit. Well, this is going to make you better than that. Maybe you just want to play with your kids on the floor and yes. not feel bad. Right. Animal flow is going to make you better at that too. So it's just about making you better in your body. But getting the general public to accept that as a, a goal or a reason for a fitness program has been a little bit harder than we first thought it would be. Like we were Yeah, I could see that. I mean, because too, <laughs> like the, the flashy, you know, headlines or think, you know, that capture attention often is burn X amount of calories or lose X amount of pounds. And mm -hmm. still it's shifting. It's definitely shifting, but still- most, and we feel like over um, larger media advertising are, are is geared around weight loss, is geared around be skinny um, because, you know, this isn't just only for women or people who identify as female, but it, it of course affects men, of course affects other, you know, um, however you gender identify. Um, I, I mostly focus on, on women and females, so that's the perspective I, I speak to. But I think especially as women, we have been so ingrained, specifically in the United States, of your worth is built around your weight. You will receive more love and approval if you are skinny. And like skinny is this like end goal. And it's, I won't get into that, but yeah. And yeah. so I just yeah. appreciate that you all are so conscious of developing a really intentional movement system that also as it's not geared to like lose weight, lose weight. It's really let's educate on how are ways of moving your body to empower yourself, to be able to play on the floor with your kids, to increase the longevity of your physical vessel. Um, yeah. So, and I have to say we were, as I mentioned, we were a little bit surprised at first at how hard it was to get that message across. And um, initially, now we're just used to it. You know, we've, we've learned what they're going to ask. We know they're going <laughs> to, but the first couple times that that we went through this long explanation of how great it is for your body. And then they said, yeah, how many calories? And then we try and re-educate and they just, they just didn't care. We just, we were yeah. so unable to move that needle. And it was so like, oh, it was, it was a lot. We, um, but like I said, you know, over the 12 years we've learned um, how to try and get our message across a little bit better. And we still say we'll never run an ad that says animal flow for weight loss. Like we're just not going to, to do that in spite of all the pressure. Um, something we do get a lot of feedback on is, you know, we have quarter million followers on our Instagram and we post a lot of videos and something that we, and we realize we take this as a criticism is that most of the people that we show, because we, re we repost a lot of our users, we don't have a lot of really bigger people that we show doing animal flow. Mm -hmm. And that's not because we don't want to highlight them. Mm -hmm. And it's not because bigger people don't do animal flow, they do. It's that when we ask and we repost your video, they always say no, which mm -hmm. I, of course, you know, I, I understand, but the, they still don't feel confident enough to have their videos blasted out to a quarter million people. Whereas yeah. a lot of our thinner users are all like, yeah, of course I want my video out there. It's Instagram, of course, put me out. Mm -hmm. So, if, and we don't want to, you know, hire actors to do that. We always use real people. But we have found that almost across the board, the people who are bigger, they don't want to be put on blast. And of course, we're not going to exploit or try to push them or do that. So yeah. feedback, we get a lot of people writing to us and saying, I really want to do animal flow, but 
I don't see anyone my size doing it. Can I do it? Is it for me? And we say, no, you really can. Like there's, there's lots of people who have all sizes of bodies who are doing it and different, you know, different skill levels. There's ways you can play with it. Like anyone can do this, but um, not everyone wants to be, be shown doing it. So for us, it becomes, how do we, you know, get that message out there? It's, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. That any able-bodied, you, you have the capacity and ability and there's ways of, um, yeah, adapting animal flow to work. Yeah. And I, and, and we, and like, I hear the criticism loud and strong that our ads do really, we don't show a lot of body inclusivity in the people that we're showing. And that's not because we don't want to show a larger body doing animal flow. Like we love it. They're great at it. We have some really powerful, strong flowists who look beautiful doing flow, but they don't want to be on Instagram. So we're not going to push it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just appreciate your awareness and just bringing that up into the conversation. And, um, and especially since we're on this, you know, topic of advertising and you're just sharing, you know, how you guys are, you know, clear, you don't want to lose weight, you know, do animal flow kind of, um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear having been in the fitness industry for 12 years, your own, just like what you've noticed or kind of summary of, of marketing and advertising and, and the, what's that? I said, sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and, and how, cause I think we, we talked briefly before we started recording how often to the framework is specifically more around fear, um, or, or shame. Um, yes. Um, there's still so much of the advertising is, is driven by those two things, fear and shame. And, you know, to start with, with the idea of shame, there's a million studies that show shame does not get people motivated to join the gym. It doesn't work. As a matter of fact, it has the opposite effect. If you start shaming someone for their weight, it does not motivate them to join the gym. I have, maybe it exists, but I've never seen a study that shows shame as being an effective tool, that it does work to get people into the gym. Yeah, no, yet, I'm going to just go ahead and say that doesn't exist. I don't think it exists. Maybe there was something sometime that showed it, but there, yet so much of the advertising is still built around you look terrible i mean was it recently there was one of the big gyms they their advertising campaign was just a picture of a pear and it said girls shouldn't look like pears join our gym <laughs> and there's you know no like, oh yeah and, and, and someone I'm gonna slap them i know <laughs> And sometimes they try to think, you know, they think they're being funny or they try to be cute, but so much of it is you need to work out because you don't want to look like this. Don't yeah. look like this. And then you get into the whole idea of, um, you know, using before and after pictures, mm. which is kind of become a, a controversy almost within the, within the fitness industry about whether or not these have a place and should they be used. And some advertising platforms have banned them. Like you're not allowed to do ads that are showing before and after pictures. I didn't know that. That's interesting that they've been banned in some. That's <laughs> Yeah, curious. a lot of places have banned them. And, huh. and I think that there's, you know, there's a place for it for the person who has gone through all the work and did a body transformation and they're proud of it and they want to show it. Well, of course, celebrate your transformation, post your pictures. People should cheer for you. That's great. But when a company then takes the clients before and after pictures and commodifies them and makes it now, this is now our marketing ploy. Mm. I think with the idea that somewhere deep inside, they're thinking that people see the ad and they look at the after and they think that could be me. I'm going to join the gym. I want to do that. But what actually happens is people look at it and they, they say, I'm the before picture. And obviously there's a before and after picture. Before is bad. After is good. I look like the bad. I am bad. I and it's immediately internalized, and they don't want to join a gym then because no. they don't see that I could be the after. All they see is society thinks I am so ugly. I need to change myself. I am yes. not worthy, and it's just you know. Mm. So it's it's when you think about it that way, you can see the psychology is pretty simple. About before and after pictures mm -hmm. are not motivating to someone who's very overweight. Like they don't say. I want to or do who it. just doesn't fit into that quote unquote ideal body, right? No matter necessarily right. and then their exact you... mass, like some, yeah. you know, some people's bodies will never be the ideal lead, you know, whatever, you know, ideal is always shifting. And ideal is of course, um, mm -hmm. a little personal and individual, but like as thin, right? Like some people's bodies, like just have a more di a different natural resting point. And exactly what you said, I mean, like kind of broke my heart a little bit when you said it, Karen, but like, 
people will see that image and see themselves as a before and then decide, oh, I'm disgusting. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm bad. Yeah. And that is how that shame loop starts to get perpetuated and initiated is that belief of on our character, on us as a person, like I am wrong. I'm disgusting. And shame is like this slippery little sh dark kind of lurker that isn't going to, it's, I, I mean, I, I appreciate that you're bringing the studies into it, but like, it's not going to initiate, motivate us into action. If it is, the action isn't going to be from a place of more of a creative, um, empowered place. It's going to be somewhat destructive in nature. It's going to probably have us isolating ourselves more, probably have us not wanting to share our stories, not wanting, to, definitely not wanting to be seen, right? If that's what we're translating those images to mean. And the more right. that that starts to happen, the more that actually feeds the shame. It's that internalization. And, you know, I can think of so many times um, going to the gym and not wanting to be seen, like not wanting any, because I'm fear of like, oh, they're judging me, they're judging me, whatever it may yeah. be. And and on the one hand, you know what? They are judging you. They just ran an ad that showed a before and after picture. Especially and if there's that kind of marketing or oh, languaging. I was working out at a gym for a while. I won't say the name because it was here in Boulder. And it was, it was, it's a well-known gym. It's a, it's a great, like awesome, like really good instructors. And I was uh, deeply, one of the um, coaches once was joking and about a, a member who had been there longer than me, who I guess used to be larger and had lost weight. And his reference to that story was calling him, oh, remember when you were a fatso? <laughs> and it was all so funny and everyone's laughing. And I'm over there thinking, what the F? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, not to be like hypersensitive, but I don't think it's hypersensitive. You cannot use languaging like that. Like that's, you mm -hmm. also never know who's listening. That's yeah. just, that's unkind. It's untrue. It's, yeah. Yeah. And I think that it create it also, you know, people joke about people saying, I need to get in shape so I can join the gym. And that's where that comes from, because they know that when you walk into the gym, someone might be judging you. And, and I think the truth is 99% of the people in a gym aren't judging you because everyone totally. at the gym is so narcissistic. They're only looking at themselves in the mirror. No one is looking at anyone else or judging anyone else. But a small handful are. And the handful yeah. that are looking at you are either thinking, hey, good for you. Look at you trying to do something. And then sometimes mm. they walk up and they congratulate you. And that's, you know, that's pretty cringe. Like, you don't want to do that because unless you're congratulating, like, don't act like I'm being special because I'm working out at the gym. Like, just yeah. stick to yourself. Or there's people who do, like, they say something under their breath or they nudge their friend. And, and it only takes you to someone to see that happen one time that they're not going back to the gym then. Um, and that, it makes me think too of the, the trend now with, you know, influencers who are shooting videos of themselves in gyms. Mm -hmm. um, but that also has the effect of people who don't want to be in the background of those videos because they don't want to be blasted out to a million people. So I don't understand why gyms are allowing people Hmm. To make their influencer videos of them working okay. out because you don't know who's in the background and then it only takes one to make fun of someone in the background and this happened I think maybe two years ago there was a girl who was pretending to photograph but she was actually making fun of an overweight person who was behind her yeah. and this video went viral and the girl who made the video took a lot of flack for it I think she was banned from the gym people attacked her she was she apologized but it's too late. That yeah, video that is. Vid, and all it did was reinforce every person's fear of going to the gym that someone might make fun of me. This person got blasted out to a million people on TikTok. Mm. And, and for every million people who are kind and don't care what size people are at the gym, that one video did damage. It well, and especially when it's going online, right? People on the like social media world, it, you know, it's just yeah like a whole other can of can of worms and it is yeah. it is and it can and if you're uh, you not not confident in the way you look you don't want to know that you might be in the background of someone's video no and it, i i act i feel pretty confident in my body these days like i like really like my body and <laughs> if i'm working out in the gym i do not want to fucking be on somebody's video i don't i'm probably right. sweating having a good time and i'm not there to be in the background of somebody's videos so that that feel, that to, that to me thinks of like permission right and you need and in consciousness right i think what just is important for all of us 
working out, out in the world, filming videos, just to have a conscious awareness of other people existing near you. And they might not want to be in your video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing that you get a lot of in the, within the fitness industry or the reason that the fitness industry can struggle with this so much is that a lot of the people who are drawn to work in the industry are people who are good at exercise. They were athletes when they were in college and they, you know, they went into exercise science. They are- I went into exercise science and I don't have that background though. <laughs> 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 it's not because I was like, I love working out, but well, that's, yeah. Yeah, but you get it. So, I mean, the industry, it's really populated by people who have bodies that respond to exercise well. Yeah. They enjoy it. They probably didn't struggle with their weight. There are, and you, you do get occasional personal trainers who they became a trainer because they went through a weight loss trend or a body transformation and they felt inspired to help others. So you do have that percentage. But the vast majority of people who are working in the fitness industry are people who have great bodies and they're good at it and it comes very easy to them. And they come to this mindset that they think that it's just calories in and calories out. And that's all we have to teach you. And they have these cookie cutter approaches and they don't understand that it's it really isn't just calories in, calories out. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of background, trauma, genetics, your environment, how many jobs do you work? How much time do you actually have in the fitness industry? So they end up, you know, they put out these things about we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And it's like, well, no, we don't. Yeah. Let's talk <laughs> more about, that. yeah, let's talk more about that. Cause yeah. that is like around, um, I think you even shared before we got on, like, you know, so many gems are using like that old style advertising and still of like, what's your excuse? Um, mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot. I've got three jobs. I take the bus to work and I have three kids I have to feed. Um, I've seen, well, something I've seen just going around this week is the one about, it's all about your priorities. You know, if you say you don't have time, just take, why don't you change that to say it's not my priority and then see how you feel about it. And, you know, and the, the idea behind it is you need to prioritize your health and get yourself to the gym. But I, all the people that I see posting that meme are, People who are, you know, 28 single and the biggest thing they have to do is go on Tinder at night. Like they don't understand the actual life pressures that come on all of the reasons people don't have time for the gym. Some of them are pretty legitimate reasons. And if you talk yeah. about priorities, they're going to say, no, feeding my four-year-old is my priority. Yeah. Um, and of course, you want to live a long life. You have to find a way to be healthy. So I'm not speaking out against that. I don't want to sound like I'm saying I, you're not. And I was, I will, I think it was but, my yeah, conversation like, in that you direction. You have to find a way to get movement and health into mm -hmm. your life. But saying that working with a personal trainer on strength training at the gym is the only way you need to do it. And you need to prioritize your funds for that doesn't make sense for a lot of people. And I think it's really short-sighted to try and frame it that way. Yeah. And I just, I feel like it's a different, um, I'm even going to, I mean, I don't know if this is bold to say this, but I feel like it comes from more of a patriarchal paradigm. The what's your excuse, like more of that shame, fear inducing kind of advertising and marketing. It's not, um, it doesn't feel conscious to me. And yeah, I don't hear you at all saying that it's not about not wanting to live a healthful life, not wanting to move. I feel so like movement is so important. Movement feels like such a fundamental key in my work and let's shift and move more into, I, I, I think of it like distinguish it between like movement for pleasure versus movement for punishment. And it's kind of like when we're in that, what's your excuse or just like, I got to burn another, you know, 300 calories because I ate a cupcake or like, <laughs> oh my God, I ate, I'm going to eat pizza tonight. Right. So I better like work out on the elliptical machine for like 45 minutes, which is what I did in college. I would like, sure. I hated it. I would hate it, but I, I'd wait till I got to a certain amount of calories burned. Right. And I hated it. So of course I wasn't consistent with it. It wasn't fun. It was, it was a way of punishing my body. It was a way of, I felt shameful because of the way my body looked because of what I saw the, you know, in a lot of advertisements or, you know, the, anyway. Um, so do you have any, suggestions or thoughts that you'd like to share around somebody who does have that, like, that is really busy or ha like has that four-year-old child and they're their priority, they're a single parent or, mm -hmm. you know, there's a big gamut of how can we bring in more move? We'll, we'll, we'll get back to the movement for pleasure, but for now, yeah. just like can movement and it can like, yeah. yeah. And so you have to, um, I think some of it is 
again, shifting away from the idea that the only way to work out is to join a gym and go to a class or work with a trainer, then it's more about getting all of that movement into your day. Um, Katie Bowman had, talks about this a lot, the idea of movement snacks and just move your yeah. body. And it can be little things like walking more. If you have the choice, you know, and maybe if you have kids, you got to bring the kids with you or carry the kids. I mean, just making the actual choices of movement part of your daily life can make a huge difference. And I've seen a lot of this even more recently. Walking is suddenly back in style as one of the top fitness things. Everyone's saying, just walk more. I so, walk all this. Walking is Yeah, close. like if you can, walk. maybe walk to the grocery store if it's close enough or yeah. try, you know. Get a dog. <laughs> 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 you know, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Walk with the kids to the park. I mean, yeah. you don't have to go to the gym. Yeah. Um, and again, some of the things, you know, you see. And also them, like you validate sit. yourself if you are walking. I think so often it's like, oh, I only walk or I didn't do. Maybe this is more like, I feel like boulder proper culture, but boulder people are so intense. And it's like, if you <laughs> only hiked four miles, it's like, who even are you? Right? Like, did boulder you even intense. do anything today? <laughs> um <laughs> But I think when our brain's operating that way, it's, it's quick to not acknowledge ourselves. And, and the less that we acknowledge ourselves for the little bits that we are working to implement, the less mm -hmm. likely that we're going to stay consistent. And I love those examples you gave, right? Because I'm such a fan of how can we have more movement in our life without creating more to-dos? None of us really need more to-dos. Most of us don't in our life. Oh, yeah. um, so how can we just integrate movement into things that we're already doing? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it. set a five minute timer. I'm such, I'm always giving clients I'm like set a five minute timer, do this. Cause usually we can find five minutes. If it's 10 minutes, sometimes that's too challenging. Five minutes. Usually we can do. Exactly. And start starting there. Yeah. Yeah. And keeping it really small and really achievable and realizing that I don't have time to drive to the gym, change, work out for an hour, come home, shower. I mean, that's a, who has well, a lot of people do, right? When you're young and single and if life is easy, you can spend two hours a day at the gym and yeah. then life happens and you can't do it. And then people begin to feel like, oh, well, I just can't keep fitness in my life yeah, because there's this I, such a small idea of what fitness has to mean. Mm. You can open that up. Maybe it just means, you know, you have an hour to play with your kids, make it an active game instead of watching TV with them, do something, crawl around on the floor, or just mm -hmm. anything to keep yourself moving mm -hmm. as opposed to being sedentary all day. Yeah. And yeah. little teeny, um, and like you said, celebrate your achievements instead of, yeah. like, don't feel down on yourself because you didn't go to the gym. Feel just happy. because you didn't you have, get yeah, that hour there, workout doesn't mean elevator. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, if, if the kids example keeps coming up, I, I've often like seen parents and I am a, I'm an aunt to 10. I've been a nanny. I remember going to like the um, playground and I would like, I would move, I would, you know, stretch, I would do some air squats and mm -hmm. not that you have to consistently move, but like, there's all these little ways. And I'm often trying to think too, of how can we like in our daily life, like when you're waiting in line at the grocery store, when you're, especially at the airport, right. When you're about to go sit oh, on yeah. a plane for however many hours. <laughs> But just allowing movement to start to be a little bit more normalized and not like you're not that weirdo who's deciding to like do a forward fold or, you know, do a lunge or, you know, whatever it may be, right? Animal flow. <laughs> do some animal flow. It's I've never great, done it in the grocery store. Great pre-flight um, pre activity, but it does get you a lot of stares. A lot of looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be bold to do that. Yeah, I don't think I've done animal flow in the airport. I've done a lot of weird movement, but I always try to find like a corner. <laughs> what like, is your challenge? Next, next time you have a flight, you need to go do a flow somewhere before you get on the flight. I will do it because <laughs> my next flight will be to go to an animal flow mentorship. So oh, okay, yeah. I'll Definitely. feel like it's homework I got from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wanted to just briefly, I'd like to hear your thoughts too on, on this, especially because it feels like in regards to what you shared at the beginning of this interview and just even just as you kind of were able to make a life choice and shift where you're living and shift your environment, how that naturally, uh, it seems to have naturally shifted your own relationship with, with movement and being more aligned into because of how you want to feel and because of mm -hmm. what you want to experience. And I might take it a step further because it sounds like you want to experience more pleasure, like the things that give you more pleasure in your life, like skiing, hiking, being able to, you know, feel good in your body. So um, I, I talk about this in my book, but the idea, and I just briefly mentioned it a little bit ago, movement for punishment versus movement for pleasure. 
Um, so what do you, and, and what I mean by punishment is when you are in that mindset of like, what's your excuse or burning calories or you're punishing your body for sure. being wrong. Um, yeah. what's your take on that? Yeah, I think that's, um, and it's still so ingrained in fitness culture overall, the whole idea of no pain, no gain. And you have to, if you don't feel bad after your workout, it wasn't a good workout. And that's actually, there's, there's no truth to that. There's no reason you should ever feel pain after a workout. Like that's just, that's just silly. Um, and for me, it's, it was, my, my motivating factor, like when I say, why do you work out? And I always think the, the reason I work out is so that I can ski better. And that's such a, an important motivator for me. Um, it will make me get up and, and work out even on days when I'm maybe feeling tired or I don't want to, but I'll think ski season's coming and I want to mm. do those harder trails. I need to be ready for the moguls. So it gets me, you know, yeah. up and gets me going. And it, it's just nice that even afterwards, um, you know, I'm not someone who gets like, if I'm doing just a strength training workout or something, I'm not going to get endorphins or crazy high like that. It doesn't affect me that way, but I will feel happy at the end of it. Cause I feel like I accomplished something and I had that little achievement and now I'm closer to feeling that. And I don't, you know, and I also don't work out to, you know, feel bad or to the point that I'm going to, you know, throw up or something like that. Like mm -hmm. you still see some work of people thinking that that's the goal of a good workout, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of crazy. It doesn't make sense to me when you actually take a moment and pause and think about that. Yeah. I'm like, it just doesn't quite line up. Yeah. yeah. So, in the, in, so my workouts are, you know, I have a personal trainer that I work with and so she, and she's able to really tailor it to me individually. And that's, you know, that's a luxury that I have that I can have a personal trainer to do that with. And then of course I do animal flow. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of days my workouts is I take the dog on a hike and we'll just say, all right, we're going to go up the mountain this morning and go up yeah. an hour and a half. And, um, I, especially in the fall, oh my goodness, in Boulder with the leaves changing and it just- it's been so beautiful. That's where my endorphins come from. It's when I'm out <laughs> hiking yeah. and the leaves are gold and the sun is out and the water is a little bit cold out and the dog yeah. is happy. To me, that's just, that's just joy. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's how it should feel. It shouldn't be like, oh, I have to go do 10, yeah. more, 10 more reps in a loud gym. Right. Know. And maybe if that brings you joy, you know, and like, yeah, I like, like, I think I just, I love how you just said like that for me is joy. And I just had, maybe I had such a felt sense because mm -hmm. I love, I love to be out hiking with my dog mm -hmm. and I often bring one of her favorite dog pals. And it's one of the things I, yeah, like is, is such an important thing for me to do because it helps bring me nature, helps connect me with myself. They're happy. I'm happy. We're moving. Um, so yeah, I think, I, yeah, I feel like, you know, the universe is a beautiful place and look at all of this. And I feel so great when I'm doing that as opposed to, you know, being in a spin class, which just doesn't sound very fun to me. <laughs> People are always hitting on spin classes. I enjoy an occasional spin class, not, not regular, but I, <laughs> I mean, I've done my share of them. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. My, my mind is often this sometimes I'm like, this is 45 minutes. Okay. I've gone 30. I can do it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think what I, I think just with all of this, I'm hoping anyone listening, just inviting more of that intentionality into your movement of what is going to bring you joy, you know, maybe pleasure feels a little bit of a dirty word for you still, um, or like, Ooh, pleasure movement. What's up? So, so, so joy, joy is nice. Right. Of like what, how, if you are going to, you know, do some specific strength program, if you are going to do a cardio, whatever, maybe how could it be a little bit more joy filled for you and mm -hmm. inviting the idea of how it is you desire to feel to be what is motivating you? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the other thing that, that I would just tie into that a little bit is the idea of, you know, your motivations being what you want to do, but also the difference between your motivation being to work out for health versus working out for a thinner body and there's a big difference in those and and I still see so much especially online you see a lot of trainers they get really upset if something is posted that's in the body positive field or like um, sometime in the last year I think it was Sports Illustrated they put a quote plus size model I mean I think she was a size 14 or something on the cover and I've never seen so many personal trainers lose their minds as they did at the idea that this person was being promoted. And, that, and what they kept saying was, 
you know, body positivity is just telling everyone it's okay to be unhealthy. Why are we glorifying this unhealthy lifestyle? I've been, and I was thinking, well, I don't know if it's glorifying it as much mm -hmm. as just saying, you know what, this person's beautiful and, and yeah. that's, and that's okay that they're feeling beautiful, but also the whole idea that skinny equals healthy. And that, you know, the fact that this person wasn't skinny means by definition, they are unhealthy. And I see that a lot of people still really insisting on that. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of studies in the evidence now that shows that your BMI does not equal your health. Yeah. Um, people who are maybe a little bit bigger overweight, they can run marathons and I'll bet you their blood pressure is going to be better than people who sit at home and are skinny, but just watch TV. I mean, Sure, there's correlations between between weight and health. I mean, there's I'm not denying at all that there's not some things that get better and they're they're correlated in some ways, but they're not equal. And it's yeah. not it doesn't mean that just because someone's a little bit bigger that they are inherently unhealthy and going to die and don't deserve to ever be on a magazine cover. Yeah, um, it's crazy. And I and I and the other thing that really struck me was the same people who were really like really upset by this cover that and the idea that how far is society gone that we're glorifying this this you know we're, we're glorifying fat people is what they kept saying and I was thinking well first of all if you look through what was on my Facebook feed today I saw 900 things that glorified being skinny and then this one magazine cover that for like 10 seconds said hey people who are overweight are okay so I don't think we're quite shifting society where suddenly everyone's going to say we all need to be overweight I don't think it was quite no direction but yeah. that was really how they they took it they were really upset that they, and I wanted to say maybe you need to stop thinking that your entire client base is that your goal is to make them thin you mm -hmm. know you don't know anything about the health or the background of the person that you're criticizing they could have yeah. great health stats yeah. And an awful lot of the people who are on magazine covers who are really thin, I mean, the way they got thin may not have been the healthiest. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see you criticizing anyone for cocaine use that's on the covers. And a lot of them are pretty famous. Or super, so, super I mean, restricted calories. Yeah. Yeah. Like either disordered eating or, you know, drug use or steroids. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are going on and they never criticize that. The only thing that gets them riled up is being overweight. Mm. So I feel like it's kind of, like they're singling out one thing mm. and it's a little bit- As like the most wrong thing. Yeah. And it, it then wrong. I think makes sense, right? Why a lot of us have had issues where, you know, we have felt wrong or bad because we weren't skinny enough. And it's like, oh, okay. Why, you know, in the past, like I mentioned, when I would go to work out, especially in college, it would be like, try and burn a certain amount of calories to try and be skinnier because I was desiring more love and approval, right? And that's like a, such a good example. I mean, it's so, so unfortunate that that's happening and that that's the response, yet it is true. You know, I made a post on Facebook about a, um, a talk I was giving, which was called Eliminate Toxic Body Shame, Celebrate the Skin You're In. Mm -hmm. I only shared a little bit about the talk. Somebody commented, I don't even know. Honestly, I only read it and I was like, okay, this is a blip. But like, they were upset with me. They're like, oh, okay. So you're just saying like, people can be like way overweight and unhealthy and you're promoting this. And I was like, how did you take that? <laughs> no, right? Like I'm wanting to support us in getting out of this shame cycle that you're clearly desiring to continue to promote. Yeah. Um, and like the one thing that they show over and over and over again what makes people want to join a gym and what keeps them excited about it and makes them going back is feeling like they're part of a community. And mm -hmm. that's what people say keeps them going. They love feeling that they are welcome. They like celebrating their achievements with other people, but community and a sense of belonging is one of the most important things to creating a successful gym environment for, for getting and retaining your clients. And if your personal trainers are posting anti-fat stuff on Facebook, you're not creating a welcoming environment for everyone, whether you realize it or not. Um, yeah. People, they, you know, you can go and have the best relationship with your personal trainer and they can cheer for you, whatever. And then you go home and you see what they just posted and you think, wow, is that what you really think of people who are overweight? Like, is that what you're saying about me behind my back? Yeah, um, it's really, a it's a really slippery slope. And I, and again, I understand on the other side, some of them, they're, they're passionate and they think that this is the way to get people to be more healthy. 
they just have a different idea of what health means and how you motivate. And so again, it goes back to the fitness industry. It's just ingrained, motivate people through shame and through fear. Yeah. And those two things together, that's what they just, they revert to instead of just saying, Hey, you're, you know, you're, let, let's have some fun together. Let's make working out fun. I'm going to make you feel good. And we're going to have a whole bunch of little successes together. Yeah. And well, and it's important that you're talking about that it. Yeah. Well, it's important to talk about it. Right. Cause as you said, they're probably, they probably don't, I would imagine they're somewhat aware, but maybe they're not, maybe they're not even aware. Right. And so no, they're important. not, they think yeah. they're doing a good thing. They certainly aren't yeah. setting out to say, I want to make people feel bad. And I, but that I, is how most people, especially if they've been insecure in their body are going to translate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, so it's important they know about it so they can start being more responsible, especially if you're in that world and you're supporting clients for your word, for what you're putting out there. Yeah. And it's how they were trained as personal trainers. When, you know, even when you look at the first thing they're given when they enter their first personal training course is a BMI chart. And they look at that and then you base all the things off that. And if you've ever been, you know, I've been to a lot of gyms. The first thing they do is they do your health assessment and they weigh you and scale you and tell you what your BMI is. And you set a goal based on that. Yeah, That's how they're all taught. And I feel like the fitness industry as a whole needs to really do some soul searching and think about how do we really talk about what is health and how do we get people to be more healthy and stop training people from the very get-go that you need to, and, and, and uh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I'm on board. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I want Karen to do a soul searching of the fitness industry overall. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. 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 I think, I think so. how do you, how do you get people in and make them, you know, want to be part of your gym? And well, yeah. And don't tell and, them they're ugly on day one. <laughs> yeah. 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 And just, it, I think it's just speaking to creating a more inclusive community, which comes with a heightened level of awareness and consciousness. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So it's becoming more conscious, educating yourself about things that might be different than you, bodies that might be different than you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anything? I mean, that was a lot. Is there anything else <laughs> that you wanted to say on that, or is a point you wanted to like clarify or summarize? No, I'm. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I feel like I, I could ask more questions, but. <laughs> I won't. Go for it. I won't. Uh, well, I have one more question. It's my ending question for everybody um, that I like to ask is what is your number one main takeaway that everyone should know or do or practice if they desire to live a more radically embodied life? I think for me, it's about really finding what is your motivation mm -hmm. or what, what, you know, what makes you finding joy and making sure that you can then bring it full circle so that you are putting yourself in a physical place that makes you happy and that you are incorporating your movement in a way that is putting you towards goals of what you want to do rather than working out to be skinny. So find out what, you know, what is it that you want to do and gear your, your motivations around that. I like that. So getting really, yeah, creating something fun that you want to do or how you want yeah. to experience life and having, looking more, it sounds like at your motivating factor. Yeah. Find your, you know, don't, don't work out to be skinny, work out because you, it can allow you to do something that gives you joy. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Karen. So much. Thanks for being here oh, for sharing um, and like having a little bit of a, you know, conversation a little bit more on, you know, specific around the fitness industry and from your own personal takes. How can listeners, if they're wanting to learn more about you, about Animal Flow, where can they go? Uh, Animalflow.com is our main website. And from there, you can, we have an on-demand channel, which is an app you can yeah. use at home. You can try it for 14 days for free. Cool. Uh, you can find instructors and take a class, take a workshop. There's all kinds of ways to experience. So just go to Animalflow.com and Animal you can get started. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Go check it out. Go, yeah. Definitely try out the on demand too. Cause I know on demand has, if somebody's totally new to it, you guys created an introduction for people who are beginners. So it's like, it guides you once you get in the app of like, start with this or start with this, which is really helpful. Yes. And then starting in January, we have a whole new system coming out that will take what? people from start all the way through a 15 class series. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to plan your own route. We got it all. Cool. Structured out for you. So that gets launched in January. Okay. So look cool. for that. That'll be fun for people. 
That will be fun. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Emily. This was fun. Thanks everyone for listening. Take care.